so hello everyone hi i'm abhishek sharma i work with object automation as a research scholar and i've been researching in different fields from electronics to data science and machine learning uh, i'll share my screen hope i'm visible i'm uh, sorry hope I hope my screen is visible. Yeah, looks good. Go ahead. Okay, great. I'll I'll start my presentation. So the topic of the presentation is building SOC and programming in FPGAs using Open Power Course. Uh, so the agenda is that what are SOCs and uh, how we build SOCs. What are different uh state of the art associates that are in the market that are in the trend the modern associates how it can be built and uh, what was the past of it and how it is different from normal processors or normal uh, simple cores so the first topic is the soc and that the topics related to associates are, are like uh, the market of the associates what are its driving factors and then concept to application concept in the concept to application uh, i'll talk about that what are the components of soc that uh, we need to understand to build like basic theme inside soc and then very brief introduction about power isa how it is unique this architecture is unique in comparison to intel x86 or arm and then what are open power cores so it's not cores it's open power cores it's mid Uh, miswritten uh, incorrectly written here then about microwatt it's one of the uh, open power cores then libersock soc brief introduction about these and then how can we build an soc and program it in a fpga so this is the basic agenda of the presentation of the uh, basic theme of the presentation i'll talk about so uh, what's a soc basically it's a chip uh, uh, an ic an integrated circuit that not only holds uh, a single component like a cpu or a processor but it holds uh, many other things also like io related thing or uh, memory or uh, power power components inside it so it's a single chip single ic which which is having your memory your uh, io your ports related your peripherals your uh, power system even gpus so that's what is an ic and soc is uh, soc is and now when all the components are there in a single ic uh, they'll take much less uh, space they are tightly coupled tightly coupled in the sense that they can interact much better in comparison to discrete components that we used to build in uh, like uh, three three decades back so they are tightly coupled coupled they, are, they use much less power and uh, they are like in a growth trajectory like we you see I, socs everywhere so uh, soc is that ic that that holds processor microprocessor peripheral and memory in in simple terms so if we compare an soc versus a cpu so i think everyone understand like what a desktop is so we see when we build or uh, when we build a desktop or when we used to build a system or a pc uh, two decades back we combine multiple components together so we purchase a cpu then my motherboard today we also do the same but uh, at that time there were there was very little or very less concept of a soc so everything in one die in a one chip was not there so we had to combine the processor with a gpu then memory then all the peripherals we can combine with that uh, processor so even processor in the earlier days did not have the controller to uh, connect the peripherals like a usb or uh, or any other networking device or anything like they were basically simple processors but today in the soc that we see in our laptop or in mobile or everywhere uh, although it depends on the type of the soc but we see a lot of components combining combined together even the wireless radios like wifi 3g bluetooth 4g 5g all these components uh, the peripherals and other things even the uh, hard coded 
uh, encoders are there also in the SOC right uh, today. So uh, what happens is that when we decode or encode a, a logic, for an example, we decode uh, in computers, we decode videos. So the video is, is being encoded here. It's, it's getting transported there and it's getting decoded there. So there must be some protocol behind it, MP4, uh, AVI, uh, MP3 for the audio, these things. So these decoding or encoding happens uh, through processing. Uh, the processor used to do through software, through logics. But today we, in SOC or in modern CPUs, we see that these type of encoding are also happening through hardware. The hardcore log logics are being implemented in the SOC. So uh, today in comparison to the past, we see very complex structure in the die a lot of com components combined together to form an SOC. Now there is a disadvantage of an SOC. The SOC is not flexible. So if you hold a PC at your home, you can increase its power or uh, in the sense like you can add extra RAM or extra hard disk or uh, extra peripheral inside it. Probably you can add a 4G module in your PC. If there is a network, inter if there is an interface, interface provided. But in a laptop, we cannot add a 4G module directly. Although we can do it externally, but not as a part of the laptop. So this is the disadvantage of an SOC. We cannot scale SOCs easily because they are fabricated in one die in one place. We cannot increase the RAM or the, uh, or the, uh, or the connectivity of our mobile. Uh, it's not possible to increase the standard of Wi-Fi 2.4 or 5 gigahertz of mobile to Wi-Fi. Uh, let us suppose Wi-Fi 6 or 6C, which is the latest standard. So this is the disadvantage of the SSE. But the advantage is they are extremely small. They do a lot of thing in uh, like in the smallest, uh, in the simplest, in the smallest possible way if, if the specific SSE is built. Okay. So uh, if you see, there are basically three types of SSEs. One is that I talked about like a SOC that with a microprocessor, like in our mobile phone, uh, the latest and state of the art from Apple A14, A13 or from the Qualcomm or because these SOC have only CPUs, they, they don't have all other extra things. So the SOC, like if you Google or check that Qualcomm Snapdragon in 845, 855, so it's a basically the processing chip with all the GPUs and all, but other things like RAM, ROM or other components, 4G and other components, they are integrated with the SOCs or sometimes it, it is there, but mostly it was focused on CPU only with other li uh, little things. The second type of SOC is the simplest microcontroller that we see in, uh, from Atmel or SMT microelectronics. Uh, uh, these we see in the Arduino boards when we do or develop some project. So these are the SOC, which has CPU, the RAM and the ROM and the other components to do everything. The third type of SOC is the application specific. So there is no particular definition, which uh, like it is having CPU or not, or GPU or not, or particular chip or not. Like for an ap application, you want a circuit, which not only uh, do a processing, but other things also depend on the scenarios, like what you want. So that's a ASIC, like application specific integrated circuit. So basically there are three types of SSC. One that we see in our laptop mobile, which mainly focused on CPU and GPUs. Then there is microcontroller, which does the part of CPU plus RAM and ROM, like a building logic and implementing. So if you are making an, doing an electronic project, you suppose you want to build a robot. Uh, walking robot or, or a robot which uh, detects the color uh, like a camera. So you might use a microcontroller. So that's an also an SOC. And third is the application specific, like uh, what is does as, as required. Okay. So uh, here it's, uh, it's almost the same thing. Like if you compare the SOC with the processor, like system on chip or a processor on chip, the, the idea is that uh, like if you see the growth trajectory, or if we see that, if you want to improve upon the, in the electronics part, there are two ways, two direction. 
either we can focus on increasing the cores of the processor add uh, transistor in that cores uh, increase its capacity so if you are focusing to that we are adding uh, like a lot of cache cache memory and also the cores and focusing on processing power of it the second direction is we are adding the transistor but we are also we are focusing that those transistors are for other purposes like memory or uh, interfacing thing so there are two directions to uh, in the in the transistor upgradation or transistor growth uh, this is a table uh, although like although the thing is that now there is not very concrete difference in today's terms on processor on chip or system on chip because things are getting so much complex if you if you check the latest and greatest state of the art socs in the market from let us suppose from nvidia or qualcomm or apple they are so complex that we cannot differentiate between what is a soc what is a processor and all because the system is so complex so this technical definition of like cache processor memory functionality it's little old in the sense like maybe a decade or something but today the things are relatively co complex so what are the use of socs uh, the socs are everywhere like literally everywhere you, any electronics that you see the mic that i am holding the 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 mic that is there it might have be having a chip which does very unique thing or, or the speaker even uh, every electronics that we see today is having an soc or uh, and not only the electronics the new new uh, electro uh, the electronic systems are coming up for an example the fan that is uh, that is only a electrical thing not a electronics thing but today we see fan which is a part of electronics so there is lot of electronic circuitry inside it to drive that fan and there is a chip inside it so so we see soc in iot devices in wearables the fitness band the smart watches uh, even the bands uh, the health tracking devices and smartphones netbooks tablet everywhere if i talk uh, about the modern socs and the most advanced socs that are uh, that are state of the art that are uh, organizations and companies are developing so it is like from the qualcomm it is 8 series processor that we see so they are latest and greatest then from samsung X, exynos uh, amd zen 4 based processors uh, these are not pro not only processors but they are basically socs so they, they include a lot of thing inside it like a gpu or uh, everything that i've talked before and intel gemini lake the apple m1 series processor that are apple has lately switched to arm based architecture and uh, like it it switched from x86 like it it has built its own processor and that good uh, the unique thing about those processor is that everything is integrated like from uh, the memory to uh, computational to gpu power everything is integrated so it's it's a soc that that is tightly coupled with all the components so uh, if i talk of this soc market and the application so actually uh, before talking about how we can build our own soc or uh, like how can we simulate in fpga like i wanted to talk about all all the things related to F socs like what is an soc and how it is growing uh, with with lot of pace so there is one uh, research and consultancy company which is gartner like it it came up with an report of Uh, related to soc market so it has said that the growth of soc the the aggregate capital uh, annual gro growth rate of soc was 8.1% from 2017 to 2023 so this was the growth rate and i believe uh, it would be much bigger from now because there is a shortage of socs everywhere uh, if you see uh, if you see or if you check the news lately during the pandemic or after the pandemic there is a sudden growth in the demand of a uh, lot of electronics uh, hardware like laptops mobile tablets for education and work from home culture so there is a demand for socs like a processor or uh, related to it 
and this demand is causing uh, like uh, scarcity in the uh, soc market so if you see that the growth is much higher from now because socs are everywhere it's in the all the iot devices smart devices that we see and uh, like everything that has a circuit is now an soc second uh, the market is the consumer electronics like we see our uh, tv fridge ac fan uh, the everything that we see that the electronics that we use the appliances that we use the microwave everything has an soc then in the telecommunication telecommunication uh, is uh, the connectivity 4g 3g uh, the communication that we use in that and in the automotive auto motives so uh, okay so if i say that uh, like today if a car is built it's almost half the electronics uh, around two, if if i talk of around 2000 or two decades back it, the car was a mechanical system so 90% was the mechanical thing maybe 5% of the 10% was electronics thing but today half of the car is electronics like everywhere now today the mo most advanced was, or the most uh, like state of the art car autonomous autonomous driving cars and uh, self driving cars they have more electronics than the mechanical thing like me mechanical part so to build a car not only you need to know mechanics today the engine and uh, uh, or, or the other things the vehicle the tire and all those things but also you need to understand the electronics behind it the the sensors the uh, the ai to tr train the uh, autonomous vehicle to train the self driving uh, to train the self driving capabilities of the car so autonomy automotives we see half of the electronics in cars today and if i talk about socs driving factors so first they are compact like logical because we cannot put a compute complete discrete computer inside our uh, like inside our uh, ac or a fridge or uh, or inside a car we we have to build a chip to do that so they are compact that that's why there is a demand then the iot adopt adopt adoption is high so today everyone wants a smart uh, wearable smart band smart fitness band uh, smart home devices which, which can work according to they, they want so if uh, that's why there is a demand for soc and the cloud adoption and the next generation uh, technologies we see so today there is lot of things happening in the cloud cloud is basically uh, we don't build our own infrastructure own software we use the cl cloud platform so like i i am talking to with uh, like i am presenting this presentation through zoom so zoom is a cloud platform everything is happening in the cloud the data processing the data transmission the data storage everything is there so this thing the cloud adoption the cloud infrastructure is also pushing the boundaries for soc and then uh, the socs they they perform the tasks much faster and they are much pa power efficient in comparison to traditional processors or traditional system see soc is a upgradation over conventional processors that was there two decades back maybe uh, this this sounds simple uh, but Uh, like if i talk of early 1990s or uh, 1980s the the technology was to have a processor and to build system to if you want to build an electronics at that time but today it seems or it looks much simpler that the complete system is there inside an soc so these these are the factors that drive uh, the soc growth okay so till now i have talked about like what is an soc how it is different from traditional processor uh, what what factors are uh, increasing its growth but to build an soc it's very complex task actually you have to combine all the components it's not that easy to do uh, you can think of building and building a microprocessor of your own but building an 
SOC, you need to understand every logic to build that SOC. So to build an SOC, it's very complex. The designing part is very complex, very challenging, and you need right tools, right, right tools, right softwares, right literature to understand that what we can do to build an SOC. Also, uh, if you want to build an SOC, uh, if you want to build an SOC, you can use the IP cores. So IP cores are open, open cores that are available, reusable, like uh, someone has built it uh, or the literature is there for the IP course, you can just use to build your own uh, SOC. Third, uh, the building block for the SOC is the ISA, the instruction set architecture. I'll talk about this uh, in next few slide. It is basically the instruction that, that we use to build, that we use to build our processor. And then we need the right tools uh, as, as I talked just now to to build, to design, to integrate everything. So this is very challenging. We, we need a lot of things inside an SOC, the bus, the, the clock, the memory and everything. And this is very challenging and formal verification is required, is now used. So I'll take a pause and I'll ask if, if any questions till now for a minute, I'll take a pause. I suppose there are no questions, so I'll continue from now. So till now I have just talked about uh, basics of SOC, like what it is, how it is different from the uh, traditional CPUs and all. Uh, now I'll talk about the instruction sets uh, and uh, what is the instruction set and what is instruction set architecture. Basically this architecture is used to build a CPU and CPU is the core component of the SOC. And specifically, I want to talk about the power ISA because power ISA is the instruction set, which is from IBM and open power foundation, and it's an open source. There's a history behind it. So what is the instruction set architecture? It's like in between the software and hardware. Basically it's a definition that how the operations will take place how the memory or the storage will be accessed, how software can use those instructions to do certain things like uh, low level software, uh, like how one plus one, two plus two will happen in the, in the processor. That's what ISA is. So ISA is that layer of abstraction that defines the properties of the hardware. Uh, actually, it, it is not that how the hardware that is implemented, it is like how we can use it, like uh, after Im implementing it, uh, that is the instruction set architecture. So uh, it hides the complexity of CPU implementation and we can innovate and we can build uh, our software above it. Like I can, after building the system, building the hardware, building the uh, SOC or CPU, we can use it and we can uh, perform the task. So that's a instruction set architecture, but there is, one dark side of the ISA also. The, the thing is that the today's ISAs, instruction sets, which are in the, in the use or in the market, they are around decades old. Like if, if we talk of x86 from Intel, it came in 1970s. Although like with every generation, with every uh, versions, they have added more instructions, more, uh, more new newer things to implement and all, but the basic fundamental thing that was there in the 1970s, it is still there. Like today, what, when we say that the system is x86 based architecture, it is actually the first time the Intel released the CPUs that was x86, uh, the last two digits were 86. So from that, the Intel used 86, 86, 86, everything. So the architecture became x86. 
okay so i have talked about the instruction sets like we need to understand we need to have or develop instruction set to build soc because it's that layer on which the cpu will be drawn or cpu will be built and then i have talked about this instruction set architecture like how it works now to build a so complete soc we need to consider all these things so i'm not going to into detail of these things because uh, i think that that would be more become more much complex but to build a soc you need to build the logics for all these things like you have to build the logic for clock the bus the cpu uh, the clocking means the frequency and then memory mapped interconnect like mmi which means like how to you can map memory or how can you can mix uh, access memory then streaming interconnect uh, then dma then i2c i2c and spi spi so these are the basic elements uh, like for even for building a very simple soc these are the basic things that are like uh, that are implemented or designed in an soc okay so from now uh, like i'll talk about the how we can use or how we can use as soc inside a fpga so fpga is basically field programming gate arrays and uh, we can implement our own logic inside it so if we have developed a soc or a processor core or any other logic uh, like a, any asic logic or a digital design uh, we can just put it inside a fpga and see that how it is it working or not so this is the basic logic or basic funda behind the fpga are like if you have a logic you have a prototype for asic and you want to check its functionality so you can check that but we cannot put like they there there are limitations for this fpgas so uh, these fpgas have their uh, they have their own capabilities there is a uh, speed at at max they can work there there is a amount of memory they can access so it's like a virtualization not exactly virtualization but uh, like these are the fpgas it, these are the electronics and if you put a uh, soft core processor Uh, which you have built, so it will behave and function like a, that software processor. Uh, that is the work of the FPGAs are. So at least you can test your simple or the basic logics in the FPGAs, not uh, large logics. So don't expect that the newest and the most advanced GPUs or the CPUs or the chips like Power Nine, Power Ten. or from the intel 12th gen or the nvidia's latest graphics you can build on these fpgas these fpgas are not meant for the those things for small projects for small uh, cap to check the small logics we use fpgas so very small soft cores we can uh, build in this fpgas that's what i have i have done and i'll, I'll show what i have done like what what processor i used or soft core i used i have used and how i have uh, put it inside the fpga okay so before that i'll talk about the power isa and how it is unique so i guess uh, electronics students or electronics people they mostly know about x86 architecture 8085 8086 and these things because uh, as i know i as i remember uh, these as intel architecture was the part of the literature or, or the part of the studies there are other instruction sets also like arm based which we see in our uh, mobile or uh, arm based systems or arm processors that we that are being used in many places like drones and all but uh, there is one more architecture which is power isa and it was there uh, from last 30 years like there were there was power pc uh, processors uh, always there but uh, even in in the initial days when um, apple switched to intel it uh, 
before that it used power pc so it was based on power isa architecture and power isa was initially managed by ibm so there is a history like power pc it was uh, power p1 is what it was the first one then power pc uh, p3 uh, it switched from 32 bit to 64 bit then uh, the architecture uh, like like power isa 2.03 it uh, the simd vmx came in that and then power isa 2.06 the power like power 7 processors like sm simd vsx uh, came in that and uh, the the setup is there which which is uh, in the university it, it was based on power 9 processor which is based on power isa 3.0 so it is one of the latest and this year only like a uh, few months i think in september or something the power 10 processors are being released by the ibm and uh, it's based on power 3.1 so what is so unique about this power isa instruction set see uh, the intel or arm they are all proprietary so if if a qualcomm is building a chip based on arm architecture it is giving the royalty free royalty fee to the arm or intel which is using is uh, its own architecture it's not available to use like it's it's a closed one okay but the power isa which it was open sourced in i think in 2019 so it's now completely open source anyone can use it anyone can implement it any type of processor so if you have the capability the logic the design or you have the engineering power you can use this already well defined architecture see to build an architecture is not that easy so there is now an architecture from last two years uh, like which is an open source and it's a good thing for the future like we need such type of open source architecture so it, actually there is open power foundation which has released which was formed to do that and uh, it's now uh, looking up this power isa 3.0 architect 3.1 architecture so in the power architecture there are three books and they focus on three different things like first book is on instruction set second is like how we can manage the virtual environment architecture third is the open environment architecture but uh, like it's a complete literature related to isa and uh, i think that would be much complex and difficult to uh, explain those things i'll move forward okay so what is like after understanding the power isa architecture uh, there are power processors from ibm so uh, if you can uh, uh, recall or remember there are two types of servers that are being installed in the in the in the systems like one is x86 second is power processors so these power processors they implement the power isa uh, the same isa which is now open source and which is are being used by many people to build their own soc so its full form is power optimization with enhanced risk so it's a basically risk risk based architecture uh, with some some changes and with, with some modification so there are basically two types risk and says can it focus it is based on risk uh, so okay so what is a software processor see uh like what we have generally uh, used is like in in our laptop mobile or uh, servers these are hardcore processors hardcore processors are extremely powerful so they are meant for performance speed and like with extremely complex and large computational parts but there is a there there are type of processors which are called as soft core processors and these are uh, basically implement meant to implement on fpgas like at that level of processor like they can do certain thing 
but they can be built entirely on fpgs like that much of processing power limited processing powers and uh, they are used with they are built with vsdl verilog or these languages the good thing about soft core processors is that uh, you can add or subtract what you want from that soft core processor so there is a core available to you you want to add an extra peripheral like a usb or something you can uh, build a type of interface or any type of interface you want to build with that processor so it provides you basically flexibility to configure the code according to what you want the, the very specific according to the very specific application of the processor and uh, using the sopc solution uh, we also have the flexibility like outside the fpgs so by, when we are designing the circuit from that soft core we can do other things also and since sopc it is ex, uh, available in the fpgs the pin out is flexible and um, so the designer has will ha will have the complete freedom with the comp component placement uh, what things you want to do with the components how you want to design the components what are the timing constraints you want to put in uh, between the buses and all so this is the basic definition of soft core basically hard core is your if you want to visualize the hard core is the processor inside your laptop or a desktop or in a cpu or in a server and soft core are very limited functionality processor which you can implement on a fpgs so there is this micro watt uh, soft core processor available actually when uh, power isa was open sourced so there was one soft core processor uh, using that power isa instructions it was written by one of the uh, members from uh, members from ibm uh, his name was anton blanchard it was written in vsdl so this microwatt it's written in uh, like vsdl but it adheres to power 3. Point, power isa 3.0 instruction set see this is not uh, possible only because now power isa is a open source so someone has written a complete core complete soft processor core it can run on fpga it can put linux it can put micro python zypher so these are the functionality limited functionality it can do and it's completely open source and it is available in github so uh, you can just download it you can uh, simulate it or you can put it in fpga and uh, these are the some technical things about the micro micro watt like it is 64 bit uh, by ndn scalar integrate integer processor core and uh, it implements a subset of power isa 3.0 or instruction set which i just told and um, it uses uh, 32 cross 64 bit register it uses visbon for memory interface there are no uh, functionality for floating point unit or memory management unit but the limited soft core is there to do basic things so uh, uh, it's 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 a repeated thing but if you want to download it you can just google it it is there in the Git, github which i did like i down i cloned it from the github so there is a there is this this github repository uh, you can download it from there and there are two ways to simulate this micro watt processor one using your own system like you don't need an extra hardware to simulate this processor uh, for that you need a cross compiler tool chain see uh, see what happens is that micro watt is written in power isa and your system is based on x86 so there is an instruction set difference so for that you need a cross compiler so what cross compiler will do or all the tool chain all all the all those thing libraries with which is there in in this url they will actually translate the power isa instructions into x86 so that it could be simulated uh, I, i'll repeat like again like your system or uh, suppose it's a intel or amd based system or even your mobile which is an arm based system so to run a different 
language you need a compiler right so to run a different kind of instructions uh, which which is not native to that the local machine you need a cross compiler so you need a layer that could translate those instruction from power isa to your x86 so there is this power pi power pc cross compiler uh, toolkit available that i downloaded from this url and uh, this ghtl ghtl is nothing but uh, it is a simulation thing so it does the simulation part of bhdl language and uh, these these are the two prerequisites so if, if someone wants to um, use this microwatt uh, or simulate it run it how it is working so uh, there are these are the steps uh, these are the prerequisites and the steps is written in the microwatt github repository and in the so basically these two prerequisite prerequisites are there so these are the steps to simulate um actually i wanted to show this but the thing is that i worked uh, in this in my linux and it, it is uh, like separate system so <laughs> i cannot switch from windows to other system right now uh, <coughs> so uh, like you have to clone the git repository of the microbot basically and there is one pre built hello world program there so basically there is this program already there uh, and if you want to test how the simulation work just copy that uh, make that hello world uh, file so when you will make that hello world file it will generate dot bin file dot bin is that executable file and in in this command like first i clone the github of microwatt second i move to the hello world so in the hello world there is the there is the hello world project and then i make it so i when i make it i make the bin file of this hello world and then i copied the hello world.bin into the ram memory of the microwatt so copy this file to the ram and again i make it so when i make it like when i am executing it and after that see in the screenshot it's written uh, this file uh, it's copied and when i do this command dot slash core and does uh, underscore tb and this so it will basically it will present a log and it will uh, execute that uh, hello world dot bin so when i did this the microwatt got simulated so the, actually this was the code that was re, uh, written in the uh, actually i must have shown that code okay me this is the code that was written there so this is the complete code but this is simulated right now so what's happening here is like the micro what is getting simulated in your system so there is a processor complete software that is being simulated and the a hello world c program it is getting executed in micro what so this was the simulate simulation part that i did second uh, see this you have done the simulation part but if you really want to see that uh, how it will behave if you if you will simulate in actual hardware or in F, fpga there are two ways so this first way was simulating it in your linux or in your system not not actual simulation not in the hardware simulation but only the software software simulation uh, to hardware in hardware uh, we can do, do this in two ways so first using is fuse soc and second is vivado basically it's vivado only fuse soc execute the vivado in uh, through command line like uh, vivado is that tool from xilin xilin um, simulation to development and design and development and everything so fuse soc is that tool that um, fuse soc is that tool that uh, runs the vivado in command line mode okay 
So Fuse SSC, it's basically that Python package manager that was uh, built, that was used, that is used to build tools for, for HDL. Uh, the main purpose is to use reusable IP score and so that you can build, simulate and create your own SOC. Uh, it's a one package that is available. Uh, you just have to download and uh, like clone it from the, its Git repository and it's a python package so you can use pip uh, pip is that python uh, package manager pip3 install fuse soc it will getting it will get installed in your system and these are the steps uh, to do to simulate the microwatt in fpga actually so um, like the important here is uh, okay, Fuse SOC library add this. So what it will does, it will uh, the microwatt path. It will add this to the Fuse SOC library. So basically, basically now Fuse SOC will get to know that uh, I have this microwatt thing that I have to simulate or run, and then this command of source and the path of the xilinx so my xilinx was installed in the system uh, i have given the source source that this is the source of the xilinx and this command fuse soc run dash the direct uh, target this is the board name this is the file name that will be executed and basically fuse soc it targeted vivado in command line mode in a batch mode and it ran, it simulated this in the actual FPGA. So uh, this was the FPGA that I was using, uh, that I, I had the access and there are peripherals at, attached to it. And uh, the bit stream, it got generated and uh, it ran the Vivado in batch mode. And it was then programmed to the FPGA. So if you can see this, if it is clear, it's written microwatt, it works and uh, a, bu a bulb like thing. Uh, this was also here. Basically, this is hello world for microwatt. Here it was simulated in the Linux uh, uh, in, in software. Now this simulation is coming from the FPGA board. So there is a difference like the code is running in this FPGA board the the first the first thing that was happening is the microwatt got simulated in the fpga now there is a code hello world code in the fpga that is simulated so this code is coming back through uh, to the port from the ports so uh, to access that I, I have had to open the uh, serial communication because the peripherals uh, in my system was attached to the FPGA using serial. Uh, and then when I reset the CPU, I got this result. Uh, to do the same thing using, uh, using Vivado, basically uh, there's not much difference. One thing that you can do is you can, the bit stream that got generated using FPGA, uh, using Fuse SOC, you, you can use that bit stream and put the, put it inside the Vivado and program the, uh, program the FPGA and the microwatt will be simulated. Second thing you can do is uh, you can do everything from the scratch. Like you can do everything in the Vivado. So uh, there is that this GitHub repository that you have to clone and all. And uh, then you have to open the project in the Vivado. And after running the project, you have to do the simulation synthesis, everything. And whatever the changes you want to change in the microboard, you can do power of open, open power course, uh, open soft course. So you can change the code as what, 
as per your requirement whatever things you want to add or subtract you want to add an extra peripheral or some extra functionality you can change it because the code is available it, it's open source microbot and uh, the instruction set is open source and uh, anyone can use it so uh, like open source things works like this only okay Ha. Huh. So this this is the basic thing. Then uh, the two ways you can do to uh, to simulate uh, F to simulate microbot in FPGA. One using Fuse SOC. Second using directly the Vivado. Uh, I also want to talk about the Liber SOC. Uh, it is one SOC that uh, that also uses Power ISA instruction. It was basically the microbot. As a base, like the the idea of microbot and then the extra implementation part. So uh, it's it's that SOC and it's much powerful or much bigger and larger than the it, it is in development. Like it, the functionality is still there, but lot of uh, component, lot of functionalities is still in development. So it's a 64-bit processor. It it follows Power ISA 3.0. And the same Fizzborn bus and uh, 32 cross 64 general purpose re registers. And the ASIC layout, like ASIC, see, for complete designing, you need a lot of tools. So, in Xilinx, provide all the tools, but uh, the tools are not open source or uh, they, are, they charge a lot of money. So, Xilinx is not free if you, are, if you want to build something. But they are using this Coralis tool. Actually, Liversock is using everything which is open source. So there is this Coralis tool. Uh, it's a VLSI tool chain, or you can say ASIC layout tool that, that is maintained and developed by Sarbonne University. So Liversock is using that. Uh, this is the flowchart of Liversock. I will not uh, dig deep, basically. Uh, the thing is that Libersoc uses everything that is open source. So uh, it uses Nimigen and MyGen for HDL language. So with, in electronics, to write a code, we write in VHDL and Verilog. Um, but the Libersoc uses a thing called MyGen or NMyGen, which is Python based. Basically, it converts your Python code in a HDL language. And then other uh, tools like Yosis and NetPNR, TRLS and OpenCD, these are open source tools to do like mapping, placement, routing, generating bitstream, and uh, fina finally putting in the FPGAs. The thing here is that if you use Xilinx, um, everything is like you have to pay for everything. and to use as open source tool, you have to do manually and use different, different open source tools. There is also one tool which automates almost everything like a light, uh, uh, like it automates from uh, like designing your SOC or designing a digital design to fabricating it, not fabricating it, but until the last design, uh, the tool is called Litex. Okay. Uh, to understand this, like to digital flow from RTL to GDS, like that from the digital design to final layout, what what is will what will be the layout for SOC? Uh, either you can use some closed tools, Xilinx software, which which is there, or there are two tools for your GDS two layout. So what? What, how your SOC will look like. Uh, there are two tools. These are open source. One is Coralis 2, which I talked before this Libersoc used is using. And second is Open Lane Road. Open Lane Road is one project uh, from Google. So basically, uh, here it is Open Lane. So basically, they are doing this uh, GDS file generation and all using eFabless. And uh, you just have to put the, put your project there, uh, uh, pull out the Docker. Like it, it's there are a lot of components there basically. So Docker is basically a uh, container thing. So 
prerequisites and all are installed in docker you have to pull out the docker for that particular uh, project and then and you have to make the gds so in the end the gds file will be generated like this second way is your corollis 2 so corollis 2 is one uh, uh, is that software or tool you can say which generates your gds2 file or the layout and um, uh, it's it's installed in uh, university of oregon which i which i exist uh, accessed and it was developed by uh, from sarbon university so this was the processor uh, it's written in there if you want to install in your system basically the the thing is that you cannot do this in your system it's it's very uh, computational uh, like what we can say that like it takes a lot of processing power to generate gds flows uh, gds2 file that's why these these tools are installed in servers and all so that they can use the advantage of extra processing power if you will try to load it in your system or do that it will consume a lot of lot of memory and uh, process it will be challenging and difficult so that's why it is installed in one of the server of uh, university of oregon i exist and i generated this gds file of this chip underscore r this is basically the adder functionality of libersoc so there are obviously in a lib in a soc there are thousands and lakhs of components like it depends on the size but every component is doing something is meant for some specific purpose so what i generated is uh, chip underscore r dot gds which is only the adder functionality and for the order adder functionality when i did the layout of of this dot gds uh, using the k layout is it's an open source tool if it's a standard tool basically if you have your gds2 file which is the layout of your chip design you can use this k layout software so this is what i did and i got this result and this is the open lane and this is the gds file from open lane it was uh, like uh, it was the layout of some other thing okay so i'll take a pause uh, and uh, like till now any questions before I, i'll move forward i'll i'll change the topic and i'll talk about something else I guess there are no questions, so I'll move forward. Uh, now I'll talk about deep learning. So very different from SOC, which I was working. And now uh, the one project I was doing is related to deep learning. And uh, yesterday only I installed, or day before yesterday in the server system and I ran that. Uh, it is basically you want to detect COVID or pneumonia using deep learning. See, the idea here is that uh, how do we detect pneumonia? Uh, pneumonia is basically your lung infection. So any type of infection, uh, pneumonia is a broader term. Uh, if it is a viral, then it's a viral pneumonia or a bacterial, bacterial pneumonia. So COVID is a type of virus. So it causes basically pneumonia, uh, uh, an infection in your lung. So how we can detect pneumonia using deep learning? That That is the task that I was using. I did and uh, I trained a model and that I trusted it, I tested it. So basically, uh, 
uh, what I did is like there are some X-ray images uh, that there is a database available in the Kaggle. I downloaded it. I uh, I trained a model based on this database, and uh, it's a classification problem. Classification like the model has to identify that whether this image belong to a patient who is having pneumonia or not. So uh, this was the problem. And like in this model, I used VGG 16. It's a type of CNN, like conv convolutional neural network. And uh, it is having 16 layers. And uh, I deleted some layers, which I'll explain the, uh, in the next slides or like while while giving a demo. So basically VGG 16 is a CNN. It's a type of transfer learning and which is obviously a sub subtype of deep learning and VGG, the, the CNN, what it does, it does is it classify uh, images into thousand categories. That was the idea of idea in the VGG 16. So uh, let us suppose you have images of uh, like objects of pen, pencil, aeroplane, animals, like thousand categories. So this was the idea uh, in VGG 16 to, to classify into thousand categories. But in this problem, I have to do only two type uh, in two categories on, on, on only. Okay. Uh, this is like this VGG 16 is it used transfer learning. Basically it's a type of transfer learning and, uh, I'll not go into much detail, but, uh, transfer learning is basically using already existing knowledge. Uh, it's like you want to build a model that identify a particular type of animal like cheetah but you don't have enough photos of cheetah. Okay. You, you might have only thousand images or 500 images, but these thousand and five hundred images, these are not enough to train a model. We need a lot of, lot of, lot of data. That's why we do data augmentation. We can also do one thing is that is called do transfer learning. Suppose we already have a model that is trained to identify animals. So, we can extend that model to identify a particular type of animal. So a model is there, which was trained on millions of images, maybe one crore, 10 lakh, something. And it almost perfectly identifies that a particular photo is having an animal or not. So you can extend that model. You can use that model to identify that whether it can, whether the image is having cheetah or not, so, but you have only uh, less images for cheetah. So, uh, this idea can be used and, uh, the VGG 16 is doing that only. And we do transfer learning all the time. So, uh, in front of us, if you, if you, if you, if you give me a new type of animal, we will easily identify it because we know how does the animal look like that. That is the logic behind the transfer learning. So basically I cloned the uh, get, I downloaded the data from Kaggle. I trained the model. I tested it. I'll show it here. Great, it's connected now. Okay, this is the database. Uh, it's by Paul Muni. Uh, it was uploaded in Kaggle four years ago. So it has images. Uh, if you can see, uh, okay checks the images of chest x-rays uh, and it belongs to normal person 
and a pneumonia person and this was this is divided into three groups like one test one train and in the end if you want to validate it you can use this basically in machine learning we trained a model with some images so we will give it normal image pneumonia image telling it that it is normal it is pneumonia it is normal it is pneumonia all the images here uh, if it's possible to yes so i guess uh, i believe I, the images are visible so it's a image of a normal person not a pneumonia so while training will tell the model that uh, this is the chest ray image of a person who is normal who is not having a pneumonia and for all these images like uh, in thousands and while training it with the pneumonia images will tell him that this is the image of a person who is having pneumonia so model will get trained and it will test itself like after training it will test it and it will test it will tell the matrix or the benchmark that how much i am correct now so in the test also the images are in the the person is having pneumonia or not but uh, the thing is that when it will test it, it it will tell that how much accurate i, I am I, uh, the model is in the end that the validation part comes so it is manually done by like us or anyone even if you are having an image of uh, your chest x-ray and you want to test that you are having pneumonia or not pneumonia or covid because covid is a form of covid causes pneumonia so if you want to do that you can uh, just test uh, upload it or test it like you uh, you just have to give the path I, i'll show how um, Um, okay, so I have put the project in the this AMP test folder. So, uh, what I'm doing. predicting lungs disease oh this is the folder that i have put the there i have put the project okay here i'll, I'll start the uh, jupiter notebook so um, I'll show the files also. So here is the data in the data set folder. Uh, this is the file that, that I'll use to train the model. And uh, this is the model file which was generated uh, day before yesterday. And this was the file. I think it will be untitled. Yes. So this was the testing part. Like in the end how you can test an image uh, it belongs to a covid person or not so if i run the jupyter notebook okay i have to activate the conda environment
okay jupyter notebook is running i have to do port forwarding and tunneling here for this i'll use this so here i'm doing the port forwarding port forwarding means whatever in this url uh in this ip i i want to access in the local port of my system like this now it is done so i guess it is visible i'll zoom it more okay so here the file these are the same file if you can see data set training and title uh, and all those things uh, to to download the data from kaggle you have to do some uh, like some task uh, uh, that also i can show okay you can remove yes yeah so this is the model that i'll start and uh, it should get uh, it should start and it should train so la yeah, this is the file okay so here in this file i have imported every um, every libraries and prerequisites that i need to uh, train this model so this is vgg16 and uh, other like importing models from keras and image data generator so basically this image data will be generator will be used to feed the images and uh, upload the images to the model and then this matplotlib then the mp these are the basic libraries and in the next line i'm i'm deciding what that what is will be the image path uh, image size so it is 224 uh, cross 224 uh, see the image size from the kaggle uh, it's very large so our model may not be understand it uh, like if it is large and if we'll train it with large image sizes it it is possible that it may perform slightly better but training part will take a lot of time and i uh, the researchers who came up with this exact model uh, logic they used 224 cross 224 and 224 is uh, good good enough size to uh, check a uh, image of the lung lung patient and this is my data path data set uh, train data set test and here in this line i am importing the vgg16 uh, vgg16 is the library that i am using here i am i am giving it input of like what input shape it will take this this library the vgg16 type of uh, layers and the input is image size 224 cross 224 and 3 cross 3 so the images belong to uh like rgb type of images so there are three dimensions to every pixels and uh weights equal to image net uh this is a type that i want to give to this vg16 and in this last parameter is include top uh, is equal to false so like as i told before that vgg16 it categorizes in thousand different categories like if i'll give it the lungs images it will try to find thousand type of categories in this but i don't want to do that i just want to know that whether it is pneumonia or not for that this is include underscore top is equal to false is given and then uh, let me start the model and for other layers i'm making it the making it like i'm making uh, i'm doing a loop for 
all the layers of VGC 16 and making it making it false. False in the sense that I don't want to every train every layer here. I want to do that. Uh, it should classify only uh, pneumonia or non pneumonia based on the other parameters that I give uh, in the uh, in the next lines. Here, uh, this glob function, glob function, what it will do, it will check how many folders are there in the train data set. Basically, number of folders. So, if we'll get number of folders, it will understand that how many type of classes do we have. So, it will also predict in the end that uh, how many types of classes that I have to produce. And then I'll flatten the layer and uh, uh, the length of this X, uh, length of this, sorry, this folder, like two types of folders are there. One is pneumonia, one is not pneumonia. So there are number two. So it will now understand that the two is uh, the thing that I want, like two types of categories. And here I'm creating the model. It will uh, take the input and it will do the prediction. Prediction here is this. This is the model summary. Like what is the model look like? Uh, the input layer and other convolutional networks and here that these are the different, different layers of the model this is the flatten that I added the dense and total parameters, trainable parameters, non-trainable parameters. The, this is that thing. Then I have to compile the model and then I have to take the images here and like, where is the image? Where is the train image? Where is the test image? And give it to it. And then I have to train the model. So basically training, I did only. Uh, now I'll start, it will take around a year. But a day, a day before I did the training and uh, this was the result. And it will uh, plot the loss and accuracy of the model and it will generate a H4 file. The H4, H5 file, this H5 file is the model file, the actual model that got generated. Now we can use this H5 file. Like the model is generated using this code. And now we can check that what it will predict for my image. So if like, it's a good test case. If anyone here wants to do that, just uh, use this code untitled dot uh, this IP by NB, the Jupyter notebook. And here from the validation, uh, give the image of the X-ray you are having and run this code. It will load the model. It will check the model for this image and it will try to predict it using this class parameter. Basically class parameter have two, will be having two variables. One is zero, one is not. So here the image that I have, I'm giving is it belongs to a person who is having pneumonia. So it should predict that the person is having pneumonia. Let me try to run it. Let us wait and let me stop this. Yeah, uh, it, it got completed. No. Yeah. So it's saying 0 0.7262491. Like the accuracy is this only for this particular image. And uh, if you want to test it for non pneumonia person, this is, these are the chest x rays. These are validation. This is for the no normal people. Just copy this. And uh, yeah, I have to also give this normal folder name.
yeah so for the normal there are two variables first like uh, the, the one variable the first element is one so it's and uh, it is almost zero the 10 to the power nine minus 28 so it's saying the first element is telling that it is normal if it is pneumonia the second element should come so this was the testing i did now uh, if if you if anyone wants to test his own chest x-ray image just give the path of that x-ray image here and this and the model is already trained you can just test it and it will tell that tell that whether you are having pneumonia or not uh, this is from my side uh, i'll complete uh, the session here any questions uh, from the deep learning or from the SOC design all the questions are welcome So yeah, any questions till now, uh, like how to upload the data from Keras or uh, sorry, from Kaggle or how to use Keras and all. Uh, okay, other than chest, how to label this? The question is, so how to label this? Uh, I'm not getting like, uh, do you want more categorization? Or okay, more part of it? So it depends, yeah. Uh, the logic will be same only and uh, the output will be all the output also will be the same you can try this same code with other types of images if you have data set of let us support your brain and you want to test that it is having tumor or not so if you have the data set you can try it with the same code like i don't think you will need to change uh, other things the classification part is that Uh, sir, if I give in this model mammogram, okay, okay, I'll model image. Um, yeah, we have only three classes. So actually, I changed the BGG model. BGG sixteen is meant for to classify thousand uh, do thousand classification, but I changed it. And actually, I have to rush through because there is not enough time right now. Uh, that how I made it into two layers uh, that I can explain. Okay, you are saying that if I give it three classes, how it is going to rea react? Reject. See. I'm I'm sharing my screen again. Wait. Yeah. So this is the code. It depends on the code. See, the model is here that when I did this, I removed the last layer of BGG 16 model. So in a deep learning, the model is having multiple uh, layers. And every layer is meant to process input in certain way. It depends on the scenarios, but in VGG 16, it is doing thousand different, different categories. I deleted that, uh, like include top, the top layer, the last layer, I deleted that. And here, uh, what I did is that data, data, data set train and this asterisk, actually it, it will just check the number of folders I am having. So if you are having three folders, it will take three, it will do that three, three, three classification or um, uh, it, it will change accordingly. Like I'm not getting what you want to say. Uh, how to make embedded chip based machine learning. Okay. Uh, embedded chip based machine learning. See machine learning is a different field. You can make logics and I think it will not be uh, good to do because machine learning is improving every time we train it. So basically there is a model and model is based on uh, like in the end after training it with data, what we have is some logics there. Uh, what to say like neurons in, in our brain and all. So it it gets better it gets changed so you want a chip that like complete chip doing the machine learning thing uh 
like exactly what what you want to let like do do come to me i'll i'll check what i can uh, suggest but embedded chip based machine learning it's it's a good thing to do yeah great okay for this question that um, if i have three classes is it going to reject it or give any one the thing is that the model that have developed it or that this model which was actually uh, it was actually this model uh, this won the prize in one of the image net competition so image net competitions are competitions that are uh, that occur to do these classification to solve these classification problems only so they have done this that they used vg16 and they did this but you can change the model like you can change the code i also changed the few lines of the code according to what i what was the scenario location of data and there are some depreciated libraries from keras so that i changed also uh, but you can change it yeah the, the lo basic logic will be uh, basic scenario will be this only Okay, I'm going to end my session.